So we got 25 minutes remaining and what I wanted to try out was something that I've never done in the past uh, semesters. Mainly because I figured um, this is gonna get mathematically super complicated. I don't want to work through it. <laughs> and even if I wanted to, it'll take a super um, large amount of time. So I haven't done it. Um, that's what this is, uh, dealing with the tunneling things. Now, your textbook does handle, um, it does handle uh, tunneling probability. So, you know, it's not like it, if I didn't cover it, you would miss out on it or something. Now, I think when you look at the textbook, you can kind of see why I, I don't cover this in my lecture. It, um, you can kind of see it here. Okay, let me do a page down. So, I mean, you know, this is kind of a small page, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Okay, I guess uh, the last uh, three, four pages of that. So about, you know, 15 pages of stuff to go get to this uh, formula. And... And I think they actually skipped quite a few steps. Um, so what I wanted to give it a try off is just uh, working through this. Um, yeah, working through this picture just uh, on Sage Math. And I think I can maybe even possibly do this without writing down anything. So so I wanted to give that a try. Um, I haven't done it yet. and. Maybe I should have practiced before this meeting, but I haven't. Let, let's see what happens. So um, I do think there are some things I need to write down. So, so let me do it this way. Um, I'm going to write down the time independent Schrodinger equation, because that's what we are solving through here. Um, yeah, so this is the potential that we'll be dealing with. Um, and uh, I'm going to just type in some of the information that is in the textbook. So some of that information is things like uh, the time independent Schrodinger equation. So this is the time independent Schrodinger equation. And um, we need to write e this equation in a couple different regions, regions one, two, and three. So, so yeah, let me maybe start out with that. I'm going to first uh, define some of the variables I'll be using, declare them, h bar, m, um, psi, maybe, x. Um, think not, this is a function, but I'll be using u not to indicate the barrier height. And I need e for the energy of the particle. So with those, I can define, a, uh, let me declare a, a function. So psi is a function psi of x. I think that's the right way to declare it. So my first differential equation in region one. So that's going to be my um, thing here, minus h bar squared over two m times the deri second derivative of psi with respect to x twice. Oh, sorry, there's a better syntax, but I don't remember it at the moment. And this potential portion, it becomes zero because in this region, the potential energy is zero. So that, um, so that left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Energy times the psi of x. Just fly. Let me see if uh, this looks right. Yeah, that looks about right. Um, yeah, so that's a differential equation in region one. Differential equation in region two looks very similar. So let me start out with uh, this and then um, insert the parts I need to. So um, I have this uh, potential energy term. It's going to be u naught times psi. And then the rest is the same. And my differential equation in the third region, that's going to be the same because it 
comes back to the same potential. So I'll just uh, remember that. So, so when you have these, I think uh, um, you should be able to solve these equations um, because once you have uh, this time independent Schrodinger equation, this is what's known as ordinary differential equation. It doesn't involve partial derivatives. So th there are mathematical methods that will just allow you to solve for it. So I should be able to, I think there's a function called a D solve or D differential equation solve. Um, oops, sorry. I meant to say hell. <laughs> D solve. <laughs> That's all. Um, so hopefully that will give me some syntax guide. Differential equation solve, differential equation, a dependent variable that we psi. Initial conditions, I'll start by not putting anything in, and the independent variable should be x. Okay, I think I have enough. So, uh, solution in region one, uh, or solutions in region one, should be uh, solve this differential equation for the differential equation one. And we are going solving for psi. Um, no initial conditions, and my uh, independent variable is x. Oh. So it's uh, asking for some of the assumptions. For example, is energy times mass positive or negative? You know, uh, yeah, that's going to be positive. So let's say assume. E times m is greater than zero. Uh, that's the syntax. So um, it, this is one of the failings of computer algebra system, which is that they tend to treat all the quantities as super general. It's treating E and m as if they could be complex uh, coefficients. I know they are positive, so I'm telling computer algebra system to assume they are this product is positive. So let's try it again. Um, I thought I already did that. Um, all right, let me just uh, make it a little bit easier. Let's have it assume that energy is positive and have it assume mass is positive. They're both positive numbers. Okay, uh, you finally have an answer. So when you look at this uh, general solution, you see that it has Oh, um, that could be troublesome. Mm. Maybe it won't work. So it's uh, using these as the solution thingy and um, yeah, maybe I the so in you know in region one that's not a problem you can kind of see it here with the region one um so when it solves for the region one they don't eliminate anything they just keep everything and i can do as far as um so assume uh, u naught is greater than e and solves two i can do the solution for differential equation, differential equation two, psi equals x, and uh, like this looks. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What well, once you account for that, the fact that this is greater than that, so this is square root of this thing. That's just gonna give you. Um, Um, uh, it's going to give you an imaginary i, so this product here will end up giving you, um, giving you a, a real argument here. Then that kind of matches what they have here. Mm. Maybe let me give this a try. So instead of having differential, dif you know, these different uh, differential equations. I can actually just keep this one, and whenever I want to go back to differential equation one, it will be really plugging in that u naught is zero. So, yeah, I think I might be able to do that. 
So, so let me do it this way. Solution in region 1 is going to be instead of that, I'm going to use a differential equation. So, um, dq2 psi i bar equal to x. Um, and what I need to do is substitute in u naught is equal to 0. Um, can I do that? I, I think I can do that. Let me just uh, give it a try and see what I get. So, because um, solution, oh wait, that's just an expression. So I think I can do this. And for to the solution, just to substitute in u naught equal to 0. All right, I think that's exactly what I wanted. So um, <laughs> I prefer this uh, complex exponential form. Uh, so for in region one, it actually doesn't make any difference. You just, uh, you know, um, it, it, the choice of whether you use trig functions or complex exponentials, all it will change is how do you express these coefficients and they will end up working out fine. But um, problem will be in the region three. So I have a solution in region one, I have a solution in region two, and um, I'll, I need a solution in region three. And one of the things that you will see them do when they work out the solution in region three is they will get this answer. Wait, where do they have region three? Um, ah, so solution in region three. Um, so in this answer, what they do is they set g equal to zero. This is on the justification that each of these, um, in uh, they stand for a momentum eigenstate. This portion stands for a wave that's traveling to the right, positive momentum. And this stands for wave that's traveling. Uh, this stands for the wave that's traveling to the left, negative momentum. And in order to make this um, solvable, what they do is they specify an initial condition that the wave is coming from left to, to right. So in this region, there's incident and reflected waves. You have waves going in both directions. But once you are through the barrier, you only have transmitted the waves. So with the solution three, uh, so I can get solution three, the exact same way I got solution one. So I'll start from here. Now, what I need to do is I need to make this portion of the solution go away so that um, so that it um, I don't have a wave on in this region that's traveling to the left. So solution three is equal to solution three substitute in a2 equal to zero. Right that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So I have solutions one, two, and three. I think it's uh, let me assign some symbols. I'll use the same symbols that the textbook is using. Um, so it'll be variables A, B, C, D, and E, I think, right? Oh, they skipped E, um, so let me use F, because uh, you know E is, stands for energy. So, okay. So my solution one will have uh, coefficients A and B, so let me just substitute, substitute those in. Uh, I'm doing this mainly so that this underscore K1 in different contexts don't get mixed up. So underscore K1 is equal to A, and underscore K2 is equal to B for solution one. So for solution two, underscore K1 is equal to C, and underscore K2 is equal to D. For solution three, did I? No, not yet. Uh, solution uh, substitute in underscore K1, the only remaining parameter that's equal to F. Okay. So uh, I need to write out some of my boundary conditions. So 
I have this, it's a, what your textbook describes as a here. Um, you have boundary conditions uh, setting that the derivatives are continuous at the boundary and the wave functions are continuous at the boundary. So my equation one, which I haven't defined yet, should be okay. Let's say my uh, wave function is continuous at the boundary. So I say um, solution one, uh, substitute in x equal to zero is equal to solution two, substitute in x equal to zero. Yeah, that's my first boundary condition, equation two. Um, and, and that will be this equation here. Uh, the wave function is continuous at the right end of the barrier. Solution two, substitute in x equals L is equal to solution two, uh, three, substitute in x equals L. Oh, oh, I need to declare L. Okay, so far so good. Um, that looks complicated. Uh, let's keep going. So I need the third equation, which is the continuity of the, the, the derivative of the wave function, that it's a smooth, there's no kink, a sudden change in slope. So I need to say uh, derivative of solution one with respect to x and substitute in x so it's a boundary at x equals zero so that value should be equal to the derivative solution two uh, that addition. that looks a bit complicated i wonder if there's a well maybe that's right um just want to see what I get if I do full simplify. Um, I think that's right. Uh, <laughs> so let's keep going. Equation four is the uh, continuity of the wave function on the right side of the boundary. So derivative with respect to solution two. Um, uh, derivative of solution two um, with respect to x at x equals l is equal to derivative of solution three um, equation four all right that looks good um, so i have a system of four equations and equations one two three and four and um, all the parameters like e and m they are or u not uh, or l all those are um, known quantities so i can imagine doing something like uh, so uh, let me say my rule is um, so my incident energy let's say that uh, um, that's one and barrier height, I'm going to make it higher. Let's say that's three. And um, my h bar, I'm just going to set it equal to one. I'm choosing some natural unit system. Um, and my L, uh, once I've chosen this natural unit system for, by specifying h bar and n, there should be some constraint on L. I'll just say L is equal to, I don't know, 0 0.1 for now. Um, so, when I substitute in uh, these parameters, then each of these equations, um, you know, takes some it, uh, uh, equations of these unknown quantities, coefficients, C, D, F, um, and C equation three, yeah, A, B, C, D. So I have these unknowns and uh, I have five unknowns, A, B, C, D, and F. So, in order to make this tractable, 
because you know five equa five unknowns, four equations, you can't solve it. The computer algebra system won't know what to do with it. Uh, I can say, okay, we'll, we'll say A is equal to one. Uh, so we are normalizing it with respect to incident wave. So I'm gonna say equation one, that's gonna be equation one with uh, uh, A substituted in for one. And same thing for equations two, three and four. Now, when I have these equations, they should now be equations in terms of four unknowns. So this is what I can do. I can um, get a solution. I haven't used the solve yet, right? Okay, so solutions, yeah, solutions. I'm going to solve this system of equations of equations one, two, three, and four. For the uh, parameters A, B, C, D, and F. Wait, not A, B, e, C, D, and F. Okay, I think that should do it. So it's something, and I'm pretty sure, yeah. Wait, let me look at the length of the solution. Yeah, yeah, there's only one. So my solutions really should be, um, uh, and this should now be a length of four, I think, yeah, because it's giving me values of B, C, D, and F. And I can make an argument that the only parameters that I really care about are B and F, because B is going to be associated with the reflection probability, and F will be associated with the transmission probability. In fact, let me do this solution. So this will give me B. Um, let me substitute in the rule that I had above. So I get this. Um, yeah. Uh, so here, um, let's see, I guess that itself is a rule. So I think I can do this. Absolute value of B squared where I substitute, use this as my substitution rule. No. Um, or get this and then take the right hand side. And then I think I can take that absolute value squared. What am I missing? Um, let me see. Okay. Um, is F not absolute value? Yeah. Okay. So I can do absolute value of that. I don't know why. Um, oh, I think I know why. So, um, numerical uh, or decimal uh, approximation. Okay, good, good, good. So this is the um, the coefficient b absolute value squared. Let me try something similar for the uh, the last solution which is our F, and I'm going to do the same thing. Take the right-hand side, put it through the decimal approximation, and say absolute value squared. And here's the fun thing. Watch this and this. They add up to one, which is what you would expect. If you have a wave that's incident and some tunnels through, then, um, then you know, you add up what tunneled through, add up what reflected, they should add up to one because everything that's incident either tunnels through or it gets reflected. And we can do other fun things. Here's one reason I defined the rule as a dictionary. We can basically see how this tunneling probability changes as I change the thickness of the thing. So 
uh, at the moment, I think this is a probably pretty thin barrier, which is why most of it is uh, reflecting. I can update my rule to say, okay, uh, my L, let's make it 10 times as thick. Oops, is that not how, it, oh wait, I need to put in a dictionary. I'm forgetting my Python syntax. Okay, that's my new rule. And let's see what happens now. Um, so let me see here, I'm gonna, try to build this into. So I have this, um, let's see, 43 n and then absolute value squared. This is my B and my F is gonna be this thing here. Yeah, now it's kind of flipped around. It's more likely to reflect than to get transmitted through. And um, there's a lot of fun things you can do with this. I guess uh, I'm over time. Uh, let me do just the one thing. I think, uh, let's see, trying to do this. Um, I think the easiest way to do it is, can I? Uh, let me do it this way. I'm going to just uh, redefine a rule without the L. So that I can do this. Um, I can define a range of L values. So they range. Uh, I, oh. So, um, uh, this isn't even, no. how do I, no, um, Um, there is a, a command for, uh, let's see, SageMath initialize array. Uh, or NumPy initialize array. I think it's so. Um, yeah, okay. I, I think I can use lean space, all right. I'm gonna just import NumPy. <laughs> Lean space is what I remember, I think. Um, L, so numpy dot in space zero to zero point zero one to uh, I don't know one zero point zero one oh, start stop. Nah. Really? Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, ah, so I can do 100. Okay, something like that, all right. So I can define this as my values of L's and given that, I think, uh, so, um, you know, this thing that I was calculating, um, so, 
I, I can do something like this. Uh, substitute rule and then substitute again. Um, this time I'll say L is equal to uh, L's uh, zeroth parameter, for example. Uh, Yeah, something like that, that works. So what I can do is I can build up the values. So for example, uh, reflection probabilities is equal to um, this uh, thing here uh, with some judicious edits. Uh, substitute uh, here, L is equal to um, L value and I'm going to build the remainder of the Python syntax for L value in uh, well, value in else. L val is that's a kind of dummy variable. It doesn't. So this is all the reflection probability values. Let me do the exact same thing, except it's not transmission probability using the F values. And I think the this will work out fine. So this is, these are reflection probability values and transmission probability values. And I want you to just plot these. I want to see if I can just plot them as a function of um, function of L values and because yeah. you know when you're using at some point when you're using a computer algebra system it doesn't really simplify expressions that you want it to. So at some point it becomes necessary to just to, uh, do, do a numerical representation. Graph it out to see if that gives you some sense. Um, um. Oh, maybe I could have done something different. Um, I think instead of that, sorry, uh, I'm kind of doing this on the fly. So in this expression, um, so the reflection problem, I had this. I don't really need an N. And I think I can just go with that plugging in L. I have absolute value squared. I think that might actually give me an expression that I can plot. Let me give this a try. Plot this um, for L 0 0.0121. 0 I don't know. No. Well, maybe. Now, there's a, something that I'm a little suspicious about. Mm, let me see if, uh, what happens if I plot this for a greater value of L. Mm. I might have done something wrong. Because so there should be um, there should be some values of thickness where you get resonant um, transmission probability. And I'm not getting that. That makes me a little bit suspicious. Um, But um, I, I don't know. <laughs> Just uh, 
It might just be that I'm not quite covering the right range. Mainly because I also don't know what I'm looking for. Um, so anyways, um, uh, let me just stop it here. I'm already 12 minutes over. But it's the kind of um, exploration that can be fun. That um, I, I'm pretty sure I'm doing something wrong here because some results don't quite fully make sense. But you know, this kind of when you look at the derivation that's in the text about like my eyes glaze over just looking at it, like just trying to make sense of this. Um, but um, kind of solving through uh, computer algebra system and plotting it out numerically and making sense of that. That's the kind of thing that um, that's more practical. And while I'm pretty sure I made some mistake in the steps above, but it, it's uh, kind of easier to play with than this complicated expression here. So, yeah. so anyways, uh, let me, I just wanted to try that out, demonstrate some of that. Um, so uh, 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 stop the recording here and um, see you all tomorrow.